All right. So, yeah, let's start with all of our materials. And let's just jump in to behaviors of graphs. And in particular, rates of change. Graph behaviors. Okay, depending on what. So, last time, if you remember, we were dealing with whether a function was increasing or decreasing. We looked at some piecewise defined functions. Uh, we mentioned the idea of discontinuity. You can draw it out. So we did all that last time. And now we're going to focus on another aspect of functions, and that's rates of change. So rates of change are how fast is a function changing over a specific period of time? It's like, say, how fast is the car outside driving by? And we're going to focus on the average rate of change. So the average rate of change between two points. Average rate of change between two points. Let me kind of explain this. Let's say we have two points, one down here and one up here. Average rate of change asks what, how fast is my function changing as it goes from this point to this point on average? What it's actually going to do is it's going to say, well, the average rate of change is going to be the slope of a straight line between those two points. All right, that is going to be your average rate of change. Now, the function itself might not be a straight line. When you graph the function, it may go up and down and do something like this. Everybody get that? So the function itself may not be the straight line, but if you looked at the function, the rate of change here would be higher, and then we go lower, and we go higher again, and the average rate of change of this function, this weird squiggle, would be the same as the slope of this straight line. I get that. 
So the slope of the straight line between the two points is equal to the average rate of change. So all we have to do is remember how do we find slope? Slope between two points we'll call the first point x1, y1, and the second point x2, y2. is often written as an M. It's the change in Y values divided by the change in X values. You guys remember that formula? It's not that big of a deal as long as you can write it down. By the way, oftentimes this is also written as the change in Y delta just means change. So the change in Y over the change in X. So the change in your Y values divided by the change in your X values. So the average rate of change of a function is gonna look basically the exact same. We're gonna look at the difference in Y values divided by the difference in X values. And just because we're going to use function notation, we won't use y values, we'll just use the output of the function. Right? So, average rate of change. Of a function, we'll call it f of x. Between... a first x value and a second x value is often denoted as ARC for average rate of change. So ARC often. And instead of Y values, there is the output of the function. The output of the function, when you plug in the second X value minus the output of the function, when you plug in the first X value divided by the difference in X values. By the way, because of this, both with the slope and with the average rate of change, we don't let the X values be the same, right? Because we don't want to divide by zero. I'm not going to write that down, but that's fairly commonsensical. Can't let the X values be zero when we're dealing with average rate of change. So let's do an example for average rate of change. Let's find the average rate of change. 
for a function. Let's say x squared minus 4x plus 1 from x value of one two and x value of three. I get the numbers correct here. So one to three. So what I would do is I would say, let's call this my first X value. Let's call this my second X value, just so we go in numerical order. And I'd say the average rate of change is going to be whatever I get as an output when I plug in three into the function minus whatever I get when I get as an output, when I plug in one into the function, divided by three minus one. So my second y value minus my first y value divided by second x value minus first x value. Okay. Um, so when you turn to your calculator, Ask yourself, if I had put three into my function, in this particular function, what would I get? I got a negative two when I plugged in a three. When you plug in a one, you also get a negative two. So the average rate of change on this function is zero from one to three. Again, that's the average rate of change. That doesn't mean this function is constant. What's really going on is we're starting at a point This is our function, the graph of which is a parabola. We're starting at a point, it goes down. So we decrease for a while. We get to a vertex and then we start increasing. And then we end up over there. Okay. So the average rate of change is zero. But this function is changing. It's decreasing for a while and then increasing for a while. But on average, slope of the line between two points will be zero. Now, obviously, uh, if we wanted to use other x values with the same function, so let's do that. Let's find average rate of change for f of x, which is that same function, x squared minus 4x plus 1 from x equals, let's start at 3 and go to five. So start at X value three, go to X value five. Go ahead and do that one on your own. 
All right. So on this one, average rate of change, difference in Y values divided by difference in X values, right? So change in Y values divided by change in X. We find the Y values by plugging in the five and the three into our function. So when you plug in five into this function, you get a six. When you plug in three into this function, you get a negative two. And then the difference in the x values, five minus three is a positive two there. Six minus a negative two is eight. Divided by two gives you an average rate of change, which is four. Obviously, our denominator was, was two in both cases, but you can have any gap that you want, right? You can go from X value of one to X value 19. Your gap is 18. Gap between X values. Uh, you can go from X value of one to X value of two. And so on and so forth. By the way, just because the average rate of change is positive doesn't mean that it's always increasing. Now, on this one, it is. So don't, don't get me wrong. This one, it is. But in general, if the average rate of change is positive, that just means the points are from left to right moving up. But in between, you might be increasing and then decreasing, right? So yes, average rate of change is positive, means on average we're moving up. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the function is increasing at all values between there. So that's just, you know, just kind of like constant. Uh, zero doesn't mean we're always constant. Zero just means on average it's zero. So the increases and the decreases could cancel each other out. But it means to have average rate of changes here. Questions about that? Now, one other way that average rate of change is could be phrased. Is on the closed interval. And then give an interval. So if you see on the closed interval x1 comma x2, that's the same thing as meaning from value x1 to value x2. Essentially. Or sometimes because the notation is already in closed interval form, some people won't, won't include the word closed. Some people just say on the interval rather than on the closed interval. 
And that's, again, don't be thrown off by that. It just means from X1 to X2. So if somebody asks, find the average rate of change of a function, let's say negative, Two x squared plus four on the interval let's go from zero to five. And then we'll do the same thing, use the same G of X and find the average rate of change on the interval. Let's go from one to six. All that saying on the first one is from X value zero to X value five. So we're doing the same thing. I'll write this one down. We're taking, oops, not f, it's g this time. We're taking our function, plugging in a five, our function, plugging in a zero, seeing the difference between those two different y values, and then dividing by five minus zero difference in the x values. And then on the second one, average rate of change, difference in y values. When I plug in a six and plug in a one, denominator, difference in the x values. What I ended up with on this first one is a negative forty six minus four divided by five. which gives me a negative 10. So on average, on that closed interval, we're decreasing by 10. On the second one, when you plug in a six, I got a negative 68. When I plug in a one, I got a two. And then six minus one is divided by five. That's negative 70 divided by five to get a negative 14. Any questions about average rates of changes? Pretty straightforward. Flow between the two points. And again, 
that doesn't necessarily mean in this case it, it is but uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's always decreasing at that rate just means that on average it's decreasing at that rate and by the way negative 10 means basically it's going down 10 units for every unit it goes over right this is still slow so down 10 for every unit we go to the right Okay, uh, negative 14 average rate of change means we're going down 14 units for every unit to the right we move. Okay, and similarly over here, this means we're going up 40 units for every unit to the right. They don't always have to turn out as integers. A lot of them don't. I just, the examples I chose did, All right? There we go. <clears throat> okay, so last class period, we looked at the concepts of increasing, decreasing, constant, and then neither increasing nor decreasing. So when a function is increasing, increasing, decreasing, constants, along a given interval. So increasing, decreasing, constant. Increasing means that left to right, we're moving upwards, right? Decreasing means left to right, we're moving down. Constant means as you move left and right, you're going steady. And then if you're in some combination of those, it's not strictly increasing or strictly decreasing or strictly constant. So increasing, we're moving up. Decreasing, we're moving down. Constant, we're steady the whole time. And we saw that graph. So if you had a graph, and I'll look up, we'll use Desmos for this. So if you had a graph, let's say on Desmos, oops, I would share that. Um, Trying to see coefficients. That didn't work very well. Nope. That'll be that'll that'll be it for right now. Okay. Not a great one, but that's okay. So let's take a look at this. Graph that I that I just created. Okay, you can see it looks like if I said 
from x value of 3 to x value of 4, what's this function doing? You'd say, well, in that section, it looks like it's increasing from 3 to 4. If I said from 1 to 2, you'd say, well, from 1, x value of 1 to x value of 2, it's decreasing. If I said from two to three, well, from two to three, it's not strictly increasing or decreasing. It decreases for some and increases for others. <clears throat> now, I want you to look at this point right here. It's roughly 2.618. And then negative 5.544. That point, if I focus in on it enough, it's fairly obvious that if I'm moving along my graph from left to right, and I get to that point, I've been decreasing. And then I start moving to the right and I change from decreasing to increase at that point. So this point is what's called a local minimum. It's sort of a bottom point of my graph, and it's called a local minimum because if this graph were to way off in the distance, turn back down and go back down again, which it doesn't, but. So it's a minimum value around this location. They follow that? A minimum value around this location. So, so last class we looked at increasing, decreasing, and constant. And now what we're going to do is look at local minimums and local maximums. So a local minimum is the lowest point in a certain interval, all right? In an interval containing that point, technically in an open interval. Lowest point in an open interval. I'll, I'll move up the screen. By the way, so we can easily see that this point is a local minimum. However, if I scrolled in here, what you'll notice is that the point zero, zero is also a local minimum. It's the lowest point around this section. Do I see that? And de the graph decreases, hits zero, zero, and then increases. Now we know it's not the smallest point of all, it's not the lowest point of all, because we can easily see over here, we dip back further below. But it is the lowest point around the, this section. In other words, it's the lowest point on the interval from negative 0 0.1 to positive 0 0.1. Or you could say it's the 
lowest point on the interval from negative 0 0.1 to 0 0.4. It doesn't always, you don't have to be either. So a local minimum just means it's the smallest point or it's the lowest point in some open interval. Okay. And on the flip side of that, a local maximum is the highest point on some interval. So if you look at this point right here, point 0.382, comma, 0 0.0451, that is a local maximum because it's the largest value, largest point, highest point on an interval. Obviously, it's not what we call a universal maximum because we can see that there are points over here which are higher. But it is a local maximum. And the thing I want to point out on this is if you have a continuous curve, the local minimums and local maximums are going to occur at places where we go from increasing to decrease or from decreasing to increase. So those maximum and minimum points happen between increasing and decreasing sections. And that's what it's okay. so, so local minimum is the lowest point in local minimum, local maximum. is the highest point in an open interval. All right. And these local minimums and maximums happen between sections of increasing and decreasing. function is continuous, then those places happen, those local minimums and local maximums happen between increasing and decreasing sections. That work? Nothing too crazy. So you should be able to recognize local minimums, local maximums, or at least approximately, like the one graph that I just showed, the local minimums and local maximums, one of them happened at zero to zero, but that local maximum was like 0 0.382. That's maybe a little bit hard to recognize, but you should, if it happens in a whole number, you should be able to you know, see that it happens. And, identify that. Um, 
So you should be able to look at a graph and see a local minimum, see a local maximum, or state the X value that gives you the local minimum is this, or the X value that gives you the local maximum is that. All right. And that's really all there is to minimums and maximums. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, the last part of chapter, or not chapter, the last part of section one three. is what the book calls our base functions or our toolkit functions that we want to be able to identify. And this is going to lead us into one five as well. So let me just write this one five as one five transformations. One three and one five are really very closely linked. And so the end of one three, we do these basic, the base functions. And then one five says, let's transform the base functions. Okay. So they're very connected. So we're going to start with some base functions. also called toolkit functions. So these are sort of functions that when you see them, you should say, oh, that's that type of a function. So if we have a constant function, so f of x, is equal to some number C. A constant function, what's the graph of a constant function look like? Well, it looks like flat, right? We talked about increasing, decreasing constant. One of the reasons it's called a constant function is because it's a flat line graph. So the graph of a constant function is going to just be a horizontal line. Another base function is the identity function. which transformations of which will be linear, our linear functions, okay? So what's our base linear function? It's f of x equals x, which is the identity function. If you input a number, I give you back the exact same number you input. And that graph is just a straight line. 
in this case, through the origin with slope one. So the identity function, when we do transformations, those give us all of our linear functions. Okay. Uh, let's do some others. Quadratic. Function, our base quadratic function is going to be f of x equals x squared. Oops. And the graph of this will be a parabola whose vertex is the origin. So the very bottom point, the minimum, happens right at the origin on f of x equals x squared. Now there's going to be transformations of that where the bottom point is a different spot, but f of x equals x squared, it's the origin. Okay. Close related is the cubic function f of x equals x to the third is our base cubic function. This one also goes through the origin, but it's great. That's something like that. One side to the left goes going down, so it's increasing the whole time, but we do sort of flatten out at the origin. Move on. All right, closely related to these, the square root function, f of x equals the square root of x. You start at the origin, and then you point that way. This never gets perfectly flat, but as you move to the right, the increase kind of lessens. There is also a cube root function. F of x equals the cube root of x. It does a similar thing, but a little bit faster. But also the cube root will allow you to have negatives as well. Remember when we mentioned domains, things like square roots, you can only put in positive values if we're trying to graph on the Cartesian coordinate system. But cube roots, you could put in positive and negative values. Now, the reason I wrote the square root function right underneath the quadratic function is because there is a link between them, right? This shape here, 
to look like that shape if I rotated that shape 90 degrees or flipped in the X and Y values, all right? And same thing, if I took this shape and flipped it, flipped the X and Y values around, it would look like this, okay? Is that right? So that's why I wrote them where I wrote them. Couple more base functions that you should be able to recognize fairly quickly. Um, one is the reciprocal function. That is f of x equals one over x. If you graphed one over x, you get an asymptote at x value of zero, where we can't divide by zero when we went through the domain of, it, of this thing. So you can have any x as long as you're not dividing by zero. And we saw we got an asymptote there. Well, this is the base function for that phenomenon, the reciprocal function. So can't type zero. And then one other function that we haven't done yet is the absolute value function. I'm sure everybody has seen absolute value. You input a number and you get the positive of that number. So if I input a five, I get out a five. If I input a negative three, I get out a positive three. And the absolute value function looks like from, for positive numbers, it's the same as the identity function. But for negative numbers, get the negative of the identity function. Okay, so you get this sharp V shape. So absolute value function get a sharp B shape. Okay, so those are our base functions. And what we're gonna do in one five is we're gonna transform those. If I know what these look like, and then you tell me, well, let's graph g of x equals x squared plus 2. You should, you'd be able to say, well, oh, x squared plus 2 is kind of like x squared. And then I'm doing a plus 2. So what's that plus 2 do to this function? Okay. So that's the goal of one five. Let me just write that down. So if I know these base functions, in order to graph a function, 
if I know my base functions. And I know what trans transformations do. Then I can graph a function without having to generate lots of points. That's the idea behind one five. I'm sure we've all plotted points and then, you know, connected the dots and then did that with functions before. All right? That's the first way you learn how to graph functions is you say, well, here's this linear function. Let's find a bunch of points. And then all of a sudden, all the points are in this perfect straight line and we can you know, do that. Well, in certain cases that can get really old, plotting lots and lots and lots of points. So a quicker, maybe more efficient way to go about it is to transform functions and say, oh, that's just a transformation from this base quadratic function. So I know it's going to look like this graph just moved up and to the left a little bit, or moved down and to the left, or whatever it is. Okay, or flipped upside down. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to say, well, let's look at a function. Let's look at all the different ways to transform. that particular function, all right? So we know the basic graphs and we want to transform the basic ones. So we're going to want to figure out what do transformations do? And what does a transformation look like algebraically and how does that translate into the graph of a function? Okay. So let's start out with a vertical shift. By K units. Oh, I should have said so. It is done by adding or subtracting K after I have my function. So I want to take my function f of x and vertically shift it. What do I do? I create a new function where it's f of x, and then I do a plus k if I want to shift it. Well, depending on whether k is positive, k is positive, it'll shift it up. When you do 
subtracting a positive or adding a negative, it shifts down. I guess if I let K be positive or negative, I can just write the plus sign. But I like doing the plus minus. Think of K as positive, plus shifts it up, minus shifts it down. Let me give you an example. Where is, there we go. On decimals. You see what I'm talking about. So let's say we want to start with the base function. Let's start with the quadratic. F of x equals x squared. There's my base quadratic. And now I want to vertically shift that. So I'm going to take my x squared, my output, and then I'm going to add some value. I don't care what it is. I'm going to use a slider just so you can see what's going on. So when k is 0, these are the same equations, right? x squared and x squared plus 0 are the same. When k starts increasing, what's happening is that my quadratic just moves up. This is the same parabola, just moved up. Okay? And when k is negative, it's the same parabola, moved down. So we're moving up and down. Right? Whatever that shift happens to be. Okay? So the parabola is just moving up or down based on what value of k we're, we're using. All right, and this Desmos has this nice feature where you can just push play and I'll shift it for you. But I want to shift it up two, I'd go x squared plus two. Shift it down two, x squared minus two, right? That makes sense? Good. So that's a vertical shift. Okay. Moving it up and down. So let's talk about the other shift. Let's shift horizontally. Now, usually a horizontal shift we say is by h units. So that's just the standard. And here's the weird thing. You know how if k were positive, a plus k would move things up? Well, in terms of the H units, I want you to write minus and then plus H there. If you go X plus two on the inside of the function, it's actually a negative two shift horizontal. If you do x minus 2, then you get a positive 2 shift horizontal. That makes sense. Shift it to the right or the left. But the shift is within the function. I'll write what I mean by that on decimals as an example. But just go x minus or plus h. And again, 
if a if it's x minus five, we're shifting to the right. If it's x plus five, we're shifting to the left. That h there is horizontal. So let's look at Desmos. Uh, once again, I'm going to blank that out. I'm going to create a new function y equals. Now, when it says shift on the inside, the function is a squaring function, right? It's the quadratic. So the operation is something being squared. So when we shift on the inside, it's something, let's say minus h being squared. And just instead of the x being squared, it's x minus h being squared. Okay. Again, when the h is zero, you get the exact same x squared, you get the exact same quadratic. But if h is positive, we're shifting to the right. Now, when I say h is positive, remember there's a minus sign here. So this is x minus 4 squared. We've shifted to the right. And if I let h be negative, this would be like having h as, as a negative 3. This is x plus 3 quantity squared. And we're shifted left three units. Everybody okay with that? And so whatever that h is, as long as it's on the inside of the function, the inside of the operation being done, then it's shifted left or right. And obviously with the vertical and the horizontal, we can, if I can move that, do both at the same time. So let's pause this somewhere. So if I wanted to shift this to the right three units and up two units, I could by just taking x minus three squared and then plus two. Okay with that. Don't get thrown off y equals x minus three. Squared plus two. There you go. So that shifted to the right three and up two. And you can see that our new bottom point went from our origin to the point three, two. Now, once you know this, you see uh, an equation that says y equals x minus 3 squared plus 2, and you say, well, that's just shifted from our quadratic. So I can take my quadratic and move it that way. Or if you had an absolute value, let me do this. Let's say I had y equals inside of the absolute value x plus 2 plus 7. I know that's going to be my absolute value function because on the inside it's x plus 2. That's going to be shifted left two units. And then the plus 7 on the outside is going to shift up 7. So I went left two units, up seven. The tip of my V should be right here where my cursor is, right? And sure enough, if we look at that, 
left two, up seven. Tip of my V is at negative two, seven. Does that make sense? All right. So those are our basic transformations, the shifts, vertical, both vertical and horizontal. Now let's do the following. Let's reflect through various places. Let's reflect through the origin. Now, actually, I'm sorry. Let's reflect through the x-axis first. If I want to reflect through the x-axis, now this is going to sound weird, but on all of my base functions, other than the constant, I think they went through the origin. So if I have something like the absolute value function, reflecting through the x-axis just means I'm flipping it upside down. And I'm going to get this red one. So here's my base function. Flip it, get the red one. That meant every point over here that had a positive output gets the exact opposite output. It gets the negative value of what we would have had as far as output goes. So all of our outputs that used to be f of x now are negative f of x. We'll get that. So in other words, the y values change. Maybe absolute values of that. By the way, on absolute value only, Y values are positive to start out with, but if you had something like the cubic reflecting through the x axis, all of the points over here would be over here, and then all of the points over here would go through there. So you'd end up going from blue to red, flipping it. If all that. So every point with a negative output would now have a positive output. I think of, but that's what it means to reflect through the x axis. So you just negate everything, all the outputs. Now, if you reflect through the y axis, What's going to happen is all of your inputs are going to change from positive to negative or negative to positive. So reflecting through the y-axis means that we create a new function with negative x as my input instead of positive x being my input. The best one I can do that I can explain this with is the square root. The square root base function is going to look similar to that. If I reflect through the y-axis, if I take f of x equals the square root of x, I get this. If I take y equals the square root of negative x, 
Now, every time I put in a negative number, negative of the negative will be a positive, so I can take the square root of it. And so we flip over the y-axis. That makes sense. Flip over the y-axis. So that's reflecting to the y-axis. And if you do both flips, you flip around the x-axis and the y-axis together, that's called reflecting through the origin. So reflecting through the origin We're going to do the negative on the outside and the negative on the inside. So if you go back to my square root function, flipping the negative on the inside flipped around the y-axis, The negative on the outside would have flipped the x-axis, right? So if I did negative on the outside, it would flip that way. Reflecting through the origin means that I flipped this way and that way. And so you get it. that look. The negative of the square root of negative x. And what happens is that every point over here, like for instance, the point 9, 3, Plug in a nine, square root of nine is three. Would have given you a point over here, which is negative nine, comma, negative three. That makes sense. So that's why it's called flipping through the origin. Every point over here has a corresponding point. So every point in my original function has a corresponding point in my new function where I negate the x value and negate the y value. So those are the transformations. These do all the shifting up, down, left, right, and then flipping. Now there's one other. So we have shifts and reflections. The only transformations I haven't gone over are the stretching ones. So there's stretching vertically and stretching horizontally. If I want to stretch vertically, I multiply my function on the outside by some constant number, A. This is the constant of how much I want to stretch it. 
I'll get into what that does. I get into Desmos. And if I want to stretch horizontally, I multiply the A on the inside. Now, just like this horizontal shift kind of works differently and in the opposite direction as the vertical shift, the stretch is gonna work differently. So a two on the outside stretches longer by two. Two on the inside is gonna actually shrink it, right? So every stretch, on the flip side of the stretch, it's a shrink. I follow. So if A is more than one, it's a stretch here. If A is less than one, it's a shrink. So stretch could mean stretching in the normal thought, you know, making longer. It also could be making things more compact, shrinking as well. So I'm going to put that stretch vertically, also shrink vertically. Also shrink horizontally. I'll give you some examples. I'll, I'll look through some examples. And Desmos, or with Desmos, I should say. Okay. So we've already done some shifts. We start with the absolute value function. If I go a negative inside the absolute value function, notice nothing really changed, did it? Because the absolute value function, every point that's like 4, 4, that would have gotten flipped to the point negative 4, 4. And the negative four four we got flipped, right? So if you reflect the absolute value function through the y-axis, every point over here, every point over there has a match. So when you flip it along the y-axis, it doesn't do anything. But if you flipped it over the x-axis or through the x-axis, reflect it through the x-axis, and you do see that nice flip. Okay. Let's do the square root. I think that'll probably be the easiest one. I've already talked about what happens if you go negative x. Inside the square root, you flip it over the y, reflect over the y. If you go to the negative on the outside, you reflect across the x-axis. If you go both negative on the outside and the inside, you reflect through the origin. And that means every point that used to be over here, like 16, 4, there we go. 16, 4 has a matching point that is negative 16, negative 4 over here. Hard to write the cursor jumps. So that's, that's that. <clears throat> Let's talk about stretching and what that means. So here's my original function, y equals square root of x. Let's say I put the number two 
on the outside. So this is gonna be a vertical stretch or a vertical shrink. But in this case, it'll be a stretch there. Now, what do we mean by vertical stretch? We mean that every single point, let's, let's uh, use our nine, th three. Every single point on my original function, when I put in the same input value of nine, we are going to be doubling the output value. So when we talk about vertical stretch by two, we mean every output gets doubled. So I went from nine, three to nine, six. And I went from 16, four, to 16, eight. And if we went, I'm using nice, perfect squares, 25, five to 25, 10. Remember that? So when we talk about vertical stretch, what we mean is all of the Y values get doubled from what they used to be if the vertical stretch is two. If the vertical stretch were three, all the Y values would have gotten tripled. Now, if the stretch were something like one fourth, well, now all the Y values get changed by a factor of one fourth. So they're shrinking by a factor of four, you said. So that 16, four would now become a 16, one. And the 93 would now become a 9 and then 3 fourths of 0.75. That makes sense. So that's what happens when you multiply a number on the outside. If you multiply a number on the inside, what's going to happen? is it's gonna be a horizontal stretch. So it's going to get closer to the Y or further away from the Y axis. Does that make sense? We're talking about vertical stretch is closer or further away from the X axis. Horizontal stretch or shrink, closer or further from the y-axis. So if I looked at my point four two, that point gets moved to two two. That makes sense. So it got moved left and right. Sixteen four now should be moved to the point eight four. So all of my X values are getting cut in half with the number two being on the inside. So technically all my X values getting cut in half, so we're doing shrinking here. And if I put like a one fourth, now all of my X values are increasing by a factor of four. So what used to be four two should be 16 two. Right there, yeah, right there. That makes sense. So those are our transformations of functions. If you make this a constant, 
let's say a constant, call it A, then I'll add a slider for A. Bounds. Let's go from negative to, actually, I don't want to go negative. Let's go from zero to positive to zero. Actually, let's go from three. If I make a slider, you can see on the inside, it's hard to see because it looks like, but shrinking and expanding as we go, shrinking and stretching. And it's actually getting closer and further away. Every point it's getting closer and further away. If I put the A on the outside, again, it kind of looks similar shifts, but this one's going up and down, whereas the previous one was going left and right, stretched. Is that okay? Good. All right, so that's the idea of all these transformations. And you should be able to say, oh, yeah, this is a transformation of such and such base graph. And this is a transformation of such and such base graph or let's say this, let's say I have a graph and I can see it's an absolute value graph. Where the tip of that V is at the point three, four. It's pointing down. What is the equation going to look like? Hopefully we all recognize that this is an absolute value, you get straight line V type thing. Well, the first thing I wanna do is notice that the V is pointing down instead of this normal up. So that means it got reflected through the x-axis. That means I'm gonna have a negative symbol on the outside of the absolute value signs, right? In order to make it point down. So equation, I'll put a negative symbol on the, on the outside of the absolute value signs. Now my point, usually, my tip of my V point is usually at the origin, but that got shifted to the right three and up four. If I want to shift to the right three, remember I have to do X minus the shift I want on the inside. And then if I want to move it up four, I have to do a plus four on the outside. So my equation would look like that. Let's say we have this. We have a quadratic. Uh, 
And let's, it's hard to see, it's hard to freehand any stretches. So let's say there's no stretch involved, no shrink stretch involved. But this bottom point, the vertex is at the point negative five, zero. So we have this one. Really hard to see stretches on freehand drawings. And it says, for instance, my equation, since it's quadratic, should have something out front, something squared, plus or minus zero, whatever. Well, if there's no stretch or shrink, and this is not flipped, then we can assume that that's just a one, right? A one is a no stretch, no shrink, no flip. If we had to write a number, a numerical value in front of this, we'd write a negative one because we flipped it. That makes sense. So a negative is the same thing as negative one. Positive one, same thing as no flipping. Um, we moved the whole thing to the left five units. So this should be x plus five. And should I have any vertical shift? No. Now, just so that you know, I'm trying to kind of make a point about how Moodle is going to look. Moodle is going to look like this. It's going to say y equals, there'll be a box for a numerical value. I think it's x minus some numerical value squared. Let me actually look that up. Oh no, maybe it's x plus some numerical value squared. And then plus some other number. Okay. So if Moodle gives you this and you have to fill in the boxes, you'd say there's no stretch, so we'll put a one in there. Be very careful about this plus versus minus. This is going to be a plus five because it's a shift to the left. And then since there's no vertical shift, you put in a zero there. So if there's no shift in the vertical direction, or if there were no shift in the horizontal direction, you put a zero in there. That makes sense. There. Okay, with that. So you look at a graph, you say, oh, yeah, that's quadratic. I could write the equation based on what I know about transformations. Oh, that's an absolute value. I could write the equation based on what I know about transformations. Oh, that's a square root transformation. I can write the equation based on what I know. Those types of things you should be able to do. So you should identify what transformations are taking place. So if I give you the equation, you can say, oh yeah, that's a vertical shift of two, horizontal shift of three, Stretch, vertical stretch, horizontal stretch, whatever you want to do. 
Now, lastly, in one five, we're going to talk about even and odd functions and mean functions. which are even odd or neither. So an even function is one that can be reflected through the y-axis and nothing changes, right? Algebraically, an even function has this feature that if you plug in a negative x, you get the same thing as if you plug in a positive x for all x's. That means graphically, if we reflect through the y-axis, it looks the same. So graphically, function looks the same as its Reflection through the y axis. Now, I'll leave some space. Well, actually, let's, I'll go into the odd functions right now. An odd function. has this property, that if you input a negative x, you get the opposite value as if you input a positive x for all x values. And if you think about what that means, so if you put in a negative, you get the opposite of what you normally would put in. This means if you reflected about the origin, you'd get the same function. So graphically, this function looks the same as its reflection through the origin. Now, I don't want to get, give you the wrong impression. There are a lot of even functions, there are a lot of odd functions, but there's a lot of functions that don't have either of these properties, all right? Lots of functions have do not have 
And so our neither even nor up. So when I say a function is even, odd, or neither, could be any of those three. Okay. There's lots of functions that are not even and also not odd. Let me give, well, let me just ask, If a function is even, odd, or neither, let's take the function f of x equals x squared. So our base quadratic. You can do this one of two ways. You can look at the graph of the quadratic. That's the way I'll do it right now. So the base quadratic does this. Is every point over here, when I reflect it through the y axis, also a point on the other side? Yes. And every point over here, reflected through the y-axis, is a point on the other side. So graphically, the function is the same as its reflection through the y-axis. So this is an even function, just based on the graph. Let's take f of x as our base cubic function. So there's the graph of our base cubic function. If I take a point somewhere on that graph, if I project it through the y-axis, there's no corresponding point over here, so it's not even, right? That's pretty obvious. There's no point over here that corresponds. However, reflection through the origin means I flip across the X, and then I flip across the Y. Sure enough, every point, if I flip the, across the X axis, and then also the Y, leads me to a point over there. If I take a point over here, flip it across the X axis, across the Y, I get a corresponding point right there. So this is an odd, function, right? I want you to think about this. We call a function even, we call a function odd. Why do you think Where do you think those terms arose from? Why is even function one with those properties? Those exponents are even versus odd, right? So in polynomials, <laughs> 
If you have a base polynomial function with an even power, let's say we wanted to do x to the fourth, guess what? It could be an even function. X to the seventh, guess what? It's going to be an odd function. Now, when you have transformations of these, then all bets go off, okay? So don't think that all, not all quadratics are going to be even functions. Not all cubics are going to be odds, but I mean, the base cubic is. The base quadratic is going to be even. The base x to the fourth is going to be even. The base x to the ninth is going to be odd. All right. Let me give you a, an idea of a function that's neither. Just so we have one in your notes. Well, can anybody think of a function that's neither? From one of our base functions. Even odd or neither. Square root of x. Square root of x. If I take a point over here, reflect through the y-axis, there's no corresponding point over there. If I reflect through the origin, well, there's no corresponding point over there, right? So the square root of x is neither even nor odd. Now, I'm going to be honest, when I get into more than just the base functions, I like to algebraically determine even, odd, or neither. And the way you determine even, odd, or neither is you stick in the negative x, because remember, even meant that when you stick in the negative x, you get the same thing as plugging in a positive. Odd meant that when you stuck the negative x in, you get the negative of the outcome we originated with. Okay. So basically, algebraically, to determine even or odd or neither is you plug in negative x into your function and then you simplify. So I'll write that down here to determine even on or neither algebraically. Plug in the negative x into the function. And if it is the same when you simplify as f of x, then we know it's even. If it's the negative of f of x, then we know it's odd. And then if it's neither of those things, it's neither. 
longer than what I've got me to write, but you guys get the idea. I'm sure there's a shorter way of writing that. So let's do this. Again, we're talking about whether a function is even, odd, or mean. And let's determine this function. Negative 3x squared plus 8. Whether that is even, odd, or mean. And I'm going to do that algebraically rather than graph. You could graph if you wanted to, but we'll do it algebraically. So I'm going to plug in a negative x. Everywhere I see an x, I replace it with the negative x. And then I'm going to simplify. Now, here's what we have to know. We have to know basic facts about squaring a negative, cubing a negative, taking an absolute value of a negative, all that stuff. So if I square negative x, negative squared gives me a positive, right? So that is the same as negative 3 times positive x squared plus 8. And sure enough, that's exactly what my original expression is. So this function is even. Let's take another example. Let's take, I'll say, g of x. Let's take 5x to the third minus 1. So to determine if something is even, not, or neither, I plug in negative x. So everywhere I see an x, I replace it with a negative x. And again, we need to know how to cube a negative. If you cube a negative, you still get a negative, right? So that's negative x to the third power. And that negative, I can multiply by 5, so I'll call that negative 5 times x to the third minus 1. Now, is this the exact same as g of x? No. Is this the negative of g of x? No. To be the negative of g of x, I would have to negate the entirety of the x to the cube minus 1, which I'd get a negative 5x to the third, but then I'd also have a plus 1. See that? So this is neither 
g of x, nor negative g of x. That means that my function is neither even nor odd. Okay, be very careful about that. Some people get thrown off by the negative one versus positive one thing. In this case, this is not the negative of g of x. The negative of g of x, we have to have a plus one. By the way, if we had something like 7x to the fifth minus 4x to the third plus 10x, let's say we plugged in a negative to that. Oh, that's a negative to the fifth power. That's still a negative. This is a negative to the third power. That's still going to be a negative. This is a negative to the first power. That's still going to be a negative. So if we can bring out the negative. Negative 7x to the fifth. Negative times negative 4 is a plus 4x to the third. And that's a minus 10x. Notice how each piece changed signs from positive to negative or negative to positive. Since they have every term changed signs, this is negative of my original function. And so my original function is an odd. One. That okay. Oops. What about this? Let's take a function, I'll call it h of x. And let's do absolute value of x minus 6. Now, sometimes the absolute values are a little bit harder to do algebraically. Because remember, absolute values get rid of negatives, but you can still do it. But plug in a negative x. I end up with absolute value of negative x minus 6. Now, if you want to, you can factor out a negative sign and apply the absolute value to that. In other words, I can factor out a negative sign and say, oh, that's the, just the absolute value of x plus 6. It's easier to see that way. Is this the same thing as my original function? No. Is this the negative of my original function? No, because I'd have to have the negative on the outside, right? 
my original function kind of negated. And negative on the outside with a minus six, not the same thing as negative on the outside with not the same as plus six on the inside. So this one is neither. My original function, nor the opposite of my original function. Okay. And so H of X is neither neat, even, or odd. And you could look at this graphically too. This is a shift to the right of six units. Here's our y-axis. If I flipped it over the y-axis, I need a corresponding point over there, which I don't have. If I flipped it through the origin, reflected through the origin, I need that point to be over there. So if You understand what the graph of this does. You can see that it's not even and also not odd. Okay. So you can either do these things graphically, determine even odd neither graphically, or you can determine even odd either algebraically. Okay. Two options there. Lastly, I want to talk real briefly about understanding other points if I start with an even or odd function. So let's say I have a function which is odd. And either I'm given a graph that goes through the point two, three, or I just know that when you plug in two into the function, you get a three, whichever one, they're all both the same. What would happen if I plugged in a negative two into that function? Since I know that f of x is, I said odd on this one, I know that every x value has this property. That if you plug in the negative of that x value, you get the negative output of when you plug in the positive value. So let's go through what that would mean. That would mean that when you plug in a negative two, you get the opposite of what you plug in, what the output would be with a positive two, right? which is the negative, of, in this case, of three. You get a negative three. You could have also thought through this graphically and said odd is a reflection through the origin. So I take over and back, reflect through the origin, you'd get the point negative two, negative three. In fact, not only would you get the point negative two, negative three, but you could have also drawn it, right? Every point along that is the same. We get that. So every single point 
on this. Be reflected through the word. All right. So you have enough uh, stuff to complete the one three one five homework. We're done with one five right now. We will start one six next time. The one six is absolute value functions. And then we will uh, move on from there. Okay. Which means the one six homework will be moved back a week. Okay. But the one three one five homework that's still new Friday at five o'clock. All right. I will see you all next time. Thank you.